Thank you very much, Dave, and thank you all very much for coming along today. Thank you very much to the Global Network for coming here to Oxford. Some of us, and I'm looking around at a number of familiar faces, you know, have been going up to Crowton quite frequently for the Keep Space for Peace Week uh, activities there. I know I've learned a lot. I've sometimes been able to come and speak. And, um, and particularly, I'm seeing a number of uh, faces from uh, Korea. And I had deliberately chosen to wear the scarf that I wore with Sung Hee and a thousand women and a few uh, su supportive uh, men, but it was, it was billed as a women's march, and as we know, that means we wanted you know, the women to take the lead on this. Walking across the, you know, the major unification bridge into the DMZ. And then while we were there, there was that petulant letter from Trump that said, you've been rude to me, so I'm going to pull out. And we sort of went quite strongly into the messaging saying, you know, this is not about two vain men. This is about the needs, the wants, the desires, and the power of the Korean people to bring about peace, to bring about the of their entire, entire peninsula. That's the hope that we have to hold. But it is a hope that recognizes that sometimes two men, vain or not, and problematic or not, and some are and some aren't, are often needed to sign the treaties. And that's why I wanted to show this, because many, many, many of us were down at Greenham Common, either living there or coming a lot. And the first picture is of a group of us who danced on top of the nuclear weapons silo. And this other side is the same silo, but it's uh, now. I mean, I, I took this photo a few years ago, but it's basically since we not only got rid of the weapons, and to do that <coughs> legally, it required that Gorbachev and Reagan met in Reykjavik and talked about disarmament, came to an agreement, and then a treaty was drawn up, like we hope a peace treaty will be drawn up for Korea, and they signed it, but we had made it happen. We, civil society, had made it happen. So it's only, we, so we have to be strategic in picking off particular weapons and particular activities, and that is what ICANN did in a very strategic and tactical way, decided that we were going to get a ban on nuclear weapons. Not because we thought that was the only thing to do and everything else would fall into place, not at all, but because it was achievable in a different way from the arms control and non-proliferation agenda and the incremental agenda that had led, had, had led to us back bashing our heads against the brick wall of, and here's the second one, the obstacle of the value attached to weapons, nuclear weapons, space weapons, the latest weapons, cyber weapons now, the value attached to those things, weapons, for security, for defense, call it deterrence maybe, and the comforting feeling that that then is imparted to people that somehow, however scary the world might be, we've got the magic pill. We've got the magic weapon. We call it a deterrent. We're fond of talking about military-industrial complex. Let's make it a bit bigger. Military, industrial, bureaucratic, e uh, academic. There are circles within circles connected in who have made careers and or profits and livings out of creating enemy images and then selling people all over the world. The military answer to those things. So we have to tackle that. But we can't just tackle it by saying it's the military industrial complex or it's capitalism. It, it is, of course, all of those things. But we then have to look at the weak points, the choke points, the, the points where we can actually make a difference. And that's the image of the kind of change that we need. So that, you know, it was, that was the kind of strategy and image 
that we tried to mobilize in getting this treaty, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. So it's a banned treaty. What it actually does is the UN negotiated it. Our job as ICANN was actually to get non-nuclear countries to understand that the nuclear weapons that only nine countries actually have, the UK being one of them, would, through their radioactive fallout, but also through the dust clouds that, because they'd be used on cities, cities are the targets, that they would send a cloud circulating around the atmosphere, and that this would be like an almost an entombment of the earth in a cloud of, 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 of dust. If, if, the dust made up of all, of all of the cities. But that dust would cause rapid freezing, cooling, but also um, it would completely disrupt the climate. Global cooling, you know, I think we called it nuclear winter in the 80s. We thought it would take a lot of bombs, the US and the Soviet bombs, if there was a war in the 80s. Now the climate scientists have looked again and they said, actually, it would take less than 1% of the 15,000 nuclear weapons still in existence if used on a handful of cities. It would cause this nuclear winter and that would cause famine, unimaginable famine. And the famine would hit the most vulnerable first. So I was going to places like Africa, talking to members of parliaments in different countries, you know, in, in, in Asia and, you know, Latin America, and say, you're in nuclear weapon-free zones, but your people will still starve. They will still die of hunger. They will still die because a handful of nuclear weapons got used by one or more of these nine countries. So it's your responsibility and your right to ban them. And through banning them, we then collectively start working for their total elimination, instead of the previous way that the international structure of treaties was set up, which actually gave value and status to the countries that have nuclear weapons. So that's what this treaty does, and it clearly prohibits the use, the threat of use, the deployment, like, you know, Trident going out uh, on the nuclear submarines from Faz Lane. The transporting, like the nuclear warhead convoys going up and down, you know, in this country from Burfield up to Coolport, it, it, it bans the um, manufacture, the production of nuclear weapons. And it also bans assisting, inducing and encouraging any, anyone whatsoever, not just any other state, but anyone whatsoever. And this is binding on companies and individuals, the so-called non-state actors, it's binding on states who sign, but it also becomes binding on, um, on individuals. And once this treaty enters into force, it will then become part of international law. And in so doing, it will mean that anyone using or preparing to use, committing any of these prohibited acts, with the intention of using of having, possessing, of keeping, of, of modernizing or enhancing nuclear weapons, could be taken to The Hague on, under, on a charge of crimes against humanity. That's the case with chemical and biological weapons already. It isn't the case with nuclear yet. And the reason why we didn't succeed back then in making any use or threat of use of nuclear weapons into a crime against humanity was because we were told that the existing legal situation with the treaties actually allowed or licensed certain countries to have nuclear weapons as long as they promised to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. This treaty takes that license, if ever that license existed, and many of us argue it never did, but nevertheless, this treaty makes it unequivocal. So this is what I can did. So yes, if you look narrowly at what we did, it was a very narrow, strategic focus. We set out to get the, the non-nuclear countries to take the lead on banning nuclear weapons. So this is the kind of way 
in which we have to think if we also now want to tackle the increasing militarization space, the increasing moves toward we to, towards weaponizing. So I just so put this together. We need to tackle some of these kinds of, I don't know if you can read this. Deterrence is one of the big problems for us. So we have to think about what it is that they are saying they need to be doing in space that we are looking at and saying does not need to be done or is, the, is not a good answer. You know that button, you, say, you know, if war is the answer, then it's the wrong question. Now here's a tool that can be useful, and I brought it along. And I'm taking it out of its case. And I'm going to hand it to you. And you, you hand it out. It's the Nobel Peace Prize. Because I can got the Nobel Peace Prize last year for the treaty. But it wasn't about one organization or a few people. We chose a young woman, one of our staffers, and a Hibaksha who had been 13 years old in Hiroshima when that bomb destroyed her school and her city, Setako. We put those were the two that represented for us why and how we had got the treaty. This is yours, as much as it's mine, as much as it's ICANN's. And we can use this to help to inspire others in all of the issues where militarizing and nuclearizing our lives, our homes, our resources, our, our fields, our roads, our seas, in which people are resisting. Because as you resist, and by, by the time you get there in your resistance, of course, the Nobel Peace Prize almost doesn't matter. And that's also why I'm sending it round, because nobody does it for the Nobel Peace Prize except perhaps Trump. But we're doing it because it's necessary. We're doing it because we want to change the world. We're doing it because we want the world to be there for children, grandchildren, the next generations, people we've never met and never will meet. That's why we're doing it. But if a little piece of round your medal can help us show people that what we as ordinary citizens, ordinary people can do, can inspire governments to go to the UN to defy the US and Russia and France and China and these countries that think that they rule the world. They even held a press conference outside the UN General Assembly, which is great for us actually because the media went along and listened to them and then turned to us and said, are you surprised to find the government staking out outside their own UN General Assembly rather than being inside the room and negotiating? When a nuclear war, or at least the use of a nuclear weapon, could be one tantrum from one of these vain leaders away. We don't have deterrence. We don't have peace. We will make change by change by change that can save the world and save our lives. And if we do it together, we can have a hell of a lot of fun. And that's where I'm going to leave it.